All right, let's get this party started. I got a chance to meet a lot of you at the door. It was awesome to hear where you're coming from. If you are just jumping into this moment, I wanna invite you, there are handouts on each table. Uh, the one I'm gonna ask you to look at first is the one that looks like this with the blue box in the front. We'll talk about the other one coming up. Uh, if you're short one on a table, could you look at another table or simply raise your hand and make sure that you get what you need for today. Can I invite us to begin in a word of prayer? Let us pray. Almighty God, you are good to us. You're faithful. Thank you that we see your faithfulness chiefly, sending your son, Jesus Christ, so that we might know life in him. And also, God, you've brought us not only into relationship with your son, Jesus, but also in relationship and community with one another. Thank you for that your gift. Pray, God, that our conversation today might just bring out the truth of the blessing of that gift, and uh, might we be changed by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so, I am Brian Davies. This topic is coming out of COVID, embracing the gift of community in an age of isolation and division. If that is not where you want to be, I will close my eyes and you can walk out. No offense taken. As I was uh, boarding my flight from O'Hare to come here, the person in front of me handed their ticket to the ticket agent. They scanned it and it didn't work. She got really frustrated. And they <laughs> finally the ticket agent looked at the ticket and said, this is the flight to Chicago. <laughs> or this is the flight to Arizona. You're in the wrong line. You're in the wrong gate. You know, and I guess because I sense that this person was incredibly overwhelmed so much so that she went to the wrong gate. Imagine she had gotten the, onto that flight, right? <laughs> and walked out of a plane in Arizona and been like, this is not where I'm supposed to be. So if you're not where you're supposed to be, go for it. Okay, let's have a conversation. Hey. Sorry. Hey, now it's not working. Give me one quick second. All right, now we're working. Okay, a few years ago, uh, the church I served in the north suburbs of Chicago entered a co-ed mush softball tournament. You know what mush softball is? Yes. It's instead of a hard 12-inch ball, it's a big 16-inch ball, and it's kind of mushy, and you play without gloves. It's really fun. And we played, we won one game, we lost the second game, which put us into the loser's bracket. We're like, okay, this is going to be a quick day. Well, wouldn't you know it, we went on a run. We won seven games in a row to win the tournament. A bunch of ragamuffins, okay? We had never played together. We played all day. Someone that was on the team who played center field was counting her steps, and she walked about 30,000 steps. <laughs> playing seven games and running out to center field the whole time. She was exhausted. That was many years ago, and we still talk about that. Isn't that pathetic? <laughs> just winning this silly tournament, but we had so much fun doing it together, and we still talk about that. Have you ever had the experience of being on a mission trip? I've uh, had the privilege of serving with Casas Por Cristo, which means you fly into El Paso, Texas. As a team, you cross the border into Juarez, and then you take a plot of land and by the end of a week, a bunch of amateur builders work with the organization and end up building a house. It is an incredibly powerful experience. Everybody kind of working together to accomplish something in such a quick time that's going to be such a blessing to somebody else. Last one. Have you had the experience of being around a campfire outside on a beautiful night? You're with friends or family members, and it feels like you're there for like 45 minutes, and you look at the clock, and you've been there for like five hours, just talking and looking at a fire and laughing and telling stories. So what do those three stories have in common? Of course, you can kind of guess the idea that when you are with other people experiencing something together, it is so 
powerful and so memorable. The truth is, God wires us such that the most powerful experiences we experience are shared experiences. Would you agree with that statement? There is something about when you experience something together and go through something together, actually, whether it's kind of tough and difficult, or it's like super fun and laughy like you just embrace it and love it even more. I wonder if you got a chance to experience last night's worship service. I did. In the last two years, and probably in the last like five years, that is the largest worship gathering I have experienced. How awesome would it have been if it were just the band and the pastor and the worship people and you in the center of the room? Singing. I would have felt kind of weird, right? <laughs> but because we were all experiencing it together and singing together, and going to eight different communion stations together with a wonderful map on the screen, right? <laughs> God wires us that the most powerful experiences we experience are shared experience. So let me ask you a question. As you hear me talk about my examples, what's an example of a memorable shared experience that you've experienced? So do me a favor and actually write that down on your paper in the blue box. I want to get your minds going just a little bit. What's an example for you of a powerful shared experience? Awesome, now I'd love to hear you share with the group what that experience was that you wrote down. What came to mind for you as you think about a shared experience? Yeah, Adam. Uh, just uh, a couple years ago, my daughter was starting to get old. You know, teenage daughter started to get old. Um, but uh, they're walking to Chicago again. So she lives in ten Tennessee and she's not used to snow falling. Oh. And had just started to fall and she could complain about how cold it was, but as the snow fell, I started out open and she said, I love this. It was so good. You know, yeah. I mean, just seeing her face my wife, and, I mean, it was just, we're, we're both enjoying the moment. Yeah. So. How many years ago was that? 2017. Right. So that's like four, five years ago, yeah. and you're still thinking about it. You, images come to mind. Yeah. That's and, awesome. And now I ask her about it. And she said, no, it's just cold. <laughs> How about others? Powerful shared experiences. Yes. Yeah. 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 In the Black Hills of South Dakota. Awesome. <laughs> uh, sharing stories of our family and singing and just viewing God's creation. Love it. Mm -hmm. And you did it together. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Others? How about your experience? Yeah, David. Uh, squished in the back of a van in Africa, <laughs> in a third world country, off to do some pastoral training and repeat that four times. Wow. What wow. country? Liberia. Oh. Excellent. Wow. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I see 97 or somewhere in there after much persuading. I convinced my dad to come to a Promise Keepers conference with me. Wow. And we had 60,000 guys in Mexico and Minneapolis and standing shoulder to shoulder and standing shoulder to shoulder with my dad. Glory to God for that moment. Thank you, my God. 1997. It's been a few years. And you still remember it. Rightfully so. Others, yes? Uh, family on vacation. We had just kind of done like a family value thing, and so one of them was do hard things, and we were at last in National Park, and here's a cinder cone volcano, which is like one of those you take two steps up and slide three steps back, but it's like, hey, let's do this. Because that's what I say when we can see those things, and it 
know, the three kids who are more adventurous said, hey, yeah, and my wife's like, no, I don't think that's a cool thing. And then the other two were like, mom, do our thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so we all did it, and it's referred to as the Cinnercone Death March. And, uh, and, uh, awesome, awesome experience. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah. Really great pictures come to mind as I think about that. Glad your family enjoyed that. <laughs> yes? And so I think that not all experiences, uh, but I just found happy things. But I was stationed in Kevin and I'm not going to So those of us, you know, they are just. Uh, you had an experience there that many, many didn't. You were being so close to it. And I'm sure you really, that stuck with you still to this day, I'm sure. Thank you for sharing that. You're right, they're not all like great moments. Right? Some of them are the toughest ones that we experience together that we remember the most. Others? Anyone else? Boy, these are excellent examples. Thank you. God wires us such that the most powerful experiences we experience are shared experiences. There's something like exponentially more <coughs> memorable about these moments. We just lived through something very difficult that was the, in some ways, the exact opposite of everything that you just shared. We were separated from one another. And that really did a number on us. There are some things that we were seeing culturally before March of 2022, that March of 2020, March of 2020 just totally brought out. I want to talk about those really quickly. So let's go this way. Division. My father-in-law retired from financial management role, very busy, working a lot of weekends. He retired to this part of the country from Chicago. He's in Sun City, Arizona. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, there's five golf courses that he's in a league with guys. They play three times a week. Now when I call it going to work. <laughs> so I text him like, how was work today? He's like, awesome, I shot an 88 or something, you know. So uh, he is in a league of 40 guys. This is so cool. When they get to the course, they play Monday, Wednesday, Friday. When they get to the course, they divide up and everybody plays with different guys. Isn't that really cool? It's kind of hard for men to build a community, right? So they have this thing where they get to the course, they kind of, in essence, have a system to figure out who's playing with who. So now you got a lot of friends. Now, in... Fall of 2020, probably about September, October, they no longer could play as a group of 40. They had to divide into two separate groups. I don't even want to guess why they had to divide into two separate groups. It has nothing to do with COVID. I'm sorry, not too many. I'm sorry? The Republicans only wanted to play with the Republicans. And the Democrats only wanted to play with the Democrats. Do you, I mean, quick question. Do you mourn that? Okay. When he told me that, I said, please tell me that that's not true. He's like, I'm sorry, Brian. It is. That is division. We were seeing it before COVID. We've seen it a lot since. Quick survey for you. I'm guessing a lot of you are part of a Christian church. I'm going to make a statement, and I want you to tell me if this statement is true. Is it true that COVID brought a sense of division to your congregation that you didn't have before? Raise your hand if that's true. Yeah, I'm afraid to say that that is true for the church I serve. It was the first time in the existence of the church I served in 2009 where kind of political talking points got brought into church meetings. And I was like, holy cow. We were seeing it before COVID. COVID really brought it out. And it is a threat to community. Kind of its twin sibling is tribalism. If I say that word tribalism, do you have a sense for what that means? 
It kind of means that when division happens, the temptation is to break up into tribes or safe spaces of people who think the same way you do or you absorb the same content over and over again because you've broken up into tribes. My sister-in-law is a mom to three kids in a public school in our neighborhood. She's in a group called Moms in Prayer. Have you ever heard of a group like that? It's Christian moms in the public school who commit to meeting together just to pray for one another and maybe do some Bible studies and discipleship. In the midst of the last six or nine months or so, unfortunately, the Moms in Prayer group divided into two groups. That was my reaction to it. She told me that over dinner on Sunday before I left to come here, you know, a few days before I left to come here. So I said, hold on, time out, Katie, really quickly. Are you telling me the moms in prayer group split up? She's like, I know, Brian. I'm like, how did that happen? She said, well, a couple moms started sending out, you know, news stories that she wanted the whole group to read. And then someone's like, I can't even read that. And all of a sudden, the group kind of split. This is tribalism. We're seeing division, we're seeing tribalism, and then the result is isolation and loneliness. Because here's the crazy thing about it. Even though we're seeing this, this is actually a false sense of community. Agree with that? When you're just like retreating to the group that you're used to hanging with, that's not really community. Uh, Dale Meyer, who used to be the president of Concordia Seminary and the Lutheran Hour speaker, is a wonderful thought leader. He talks about the loss of what he called mediating institutions. These places that people used to go to, they used to be in church lobbies or the BFW halls or Rotary Club, where you were actually forced to hang with people who thought differently than you did and to hear opinions differently than you did. And what would happen was your position, which maybe was far one way or far the other, got mediated. Do you know what I mean by that? You kind of got brought to the middle because you saw flesh and blood people. Ah, you know, you know what Bill's kind of right about that. I kind of see that differently. So the exact opposite is happening now. Instead of kind of a rush into mediating institutions, what are people doing? Kind of fleeing to their camp. Right? Where I can hear the same messages over and over again, it kind of validates and improves my opinion. Are people making money off of that? A hundred percent. There's a book out called Hate Inc., um, which talks about how companies monetize hate because hate is an emotion that becomes addictive and people want to get it fed. So people who have kind of left that hate industrial complex, if you will, talk about being a mouthpiece on TV and in the ear, the, the producers would be saying, you got to get angrier. You got to get angrier. You got to fire them up more. You're not hateful enough. I remember when ESPN, sorry if I'm losing a few here, but was just Sports Center <laughs> Highlights. Yeah. I like that era, personally. Then it became part of the interruption which was, let's get two people fighting about sports and having hot takes. And I know that's kind of a funny example, but it's kind of a real life example that we can't like absorb civil dialogue anymore. It's gotta be heightened for me to watch it. And lest we think, well, that's just an ESPN thing. Have you seen any clips from your local school board meetings lately? So, we're kind of started with some of these thoughts, and it's leading to this major health insurance provider, Cigna. Have you heard of that company? Did a massive survey a couple of years ago with 20,000 adults on the issue of loneliness and mental health. And what they did was they traced mental health issues kind of across age groups. You have hours, kids, teenagers, junior high kids mental health and sense of loneliness and isolation versus you know, senior citizens in nursing homes and how they were feeling lonely and isolation. Now, I'm talking about this, and you can probably guess the results are gonna be scandalous, but going into that, what, would you, what group would you think would be the most lonely? I would have thought if someone's in a nursing home by themselves, away from their families, they're gonna feel the most lonely and isolated. Do you know what's actually the case? 
It's the exact opposite. The folks, middle school kids, feel it the worst. Senior citizens experience it the least. Let me ask you a question. Why might that be the case? Uh, Finney? Okay. Okay, very good. Any other thoughts? A sense of community. We've already got some sense of identity yep. that the kids are still working on. I think that's true. And, and also what they pointed to is the reality that senior citizens are just really good at building authentic community. Even if they're in a situation where they're away from their family, have you been to a, a senior center luncheon? You can't even get a word in. <laughs> because guess what? They talk to each other at the tables. They're really good at authentic community, asking questions and building relationships. Those are skills that our students, and I'm sorry to say it, I know we're already starting to talk about this. The last two years, they haven't had to practice that skill at all. Haven't been able to practice that skill at all. So we're on the cusp of something that's unfortunately, I think, going to get even worse. And the good news is, is that you know, people are starting to recognize the issue. And really what I want to talk about in the rest of my presentation is kind of what we can do as the church to actually help. Because guess what? Jesus can help us with this. All right? A couple other quick thoughts to share. So I think we're all seeing chaos circling around us. And it's leading us to ask the question, how did we get here? So divided, so tribal, resulting in so much isolation and loneliness. In the last week, I talked to a pharmacist, and I asked him, what's it like to be you in this? He said, you don't want to know. I said, no, I actually want to know. He's like, no, you don't want to know. I said, well, now you've really sparked my curiosity. What's it like to be you these days? He goes, this is horrible. I'm getting yelled at by every customer for every single thing. That's not my fault. I talked to my kid's middle school principal. What's it like, do you think, to be a middle school principal right now? So I said, Mr. Smith, hey, what's it like to be you right now? He goes, do you really want to know? <laughs> I said, Mr. Smith, I actually do want to know. He's like, it's really, really, really hard. I feel like we take steps, and then the carpet gets completely pulled out from under me. And folks that uh, are starting to hang with our church, so I had a conversation with them, and so I said, uh, Teresa, what are you having to do for a consultation? She's like, I'm a customer service supervisor. I'm like, I am so sorry. I don't want any job right now that starts with the words customer service. Right? And I said, how do you get through that? She's like, well, I do like the moment that I actually get to help people. So we have this world that is just at each other like crazy. I heard this quote. I thought it was so powerful. Oops, not there yet. Uh, I think so. Hold on. This quote, I love it. As anxiety goes up, empathy goes down. Would you agree with that? You, know, you would agree that this is true culturally. So the question is why? Why is it okay now to walk into a pharmacy and not get what you want and to actually light up the pharmacist? How did that happen? How did it happen that middle school principals are now basically community dartboards? I think it's because it's anxiety collectively is going up. We're divided, we're isolated, we're tribal, and it just becomes easy, in essence, to yell like that. All right, uh, let's take a look at this. I just love this. Oops, here we go. Spoken to anyone else that night. I'm going to go out of the house and 
make a friend so you talk to other people about this stuff and not just me. That's insane. Where would I even go? Finally, there's a place with man art. <laughs> <laughs> so you can make friends and have like besides their girlfriends and all. Rise and grind. Rise and grind. Rise and grind, brother. That's what SNL does when they're at their best, is point out something in culture and kind of bring light to it. Saw this quote from Tim Keller, maybe you've seen it, and this helps me explain why we're having so much anxiety collectively as a culture. If work is your idol, I love this, success goes to your head, and <coughs> failure goes to your heart. Like, it, like, when things aren't going right at work, it has this capacity to, like, pierce our hearts. And I guess to build off of this, this would not be the Tim Keller quote, this would be the me quote, inspired by Tim Keller. If church is your idol, success goes to your head, failure goes to your heart. And then really it's almost true for just about anything. If blank is your idol, success goes to your head and failure goes to your heart. It's almost true for any idol that we make. I know like, where I live, uh, youth sports are like a beast, an animal. The busiest parking lot on Sundays is the soccer field, not the churches anymore. It's probably like most of your communities. When that got taken away from parents, what parents collectively said to the leaders was, don't worry, we trust your decision making. If you don't think it's okay, we'll follow the rules. <laughs> right? Not what happened in my community, and probably not what happened in yours either, because something was taken away, it brought a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety. So what I want to do in the rest of the time I have with you is to really focus on this. The Lord sees this. I heard it said the other day that um, the Lord is seated on a throne intentionally. He's not pacing nervously around the throne. He's seated on the throne, reigning on high, saying, I see what you're going through, and I offer something for you. And what he offers is this. He offers a sense of identity and belonging in him, and a sense of identity and belonging with his people. Have you heard of the musician James Taylor? So I didn't really know who James Taylor was until friends invited us to see James Taylor at an outdoor concert venue in Chicago called Fravinia. And we went to a James Taylor concert, and it was the first time I really was exposed to his music in such a way. And I was like, dude, these are like all of my songs that I didn't even know were James Taylor songs. So then the next morning I woke up early, because I just woke up early and started 
researching the songs that he wrote. Um, when you think of James Taylor, what song do you think of? Yeah. You've got a friend. Okay, Fire and Rain. And then there's Carolina on My Mind. So I heard that song thinking, well, this must be a really cool, like, Carolina tourism song. Like, everyone should go to North Carolina because it's really nice there. So here's what Carolina on My Mind is really like. I get goosebumps thinking about this, sorry. So James Taylor's father was a professor at the University of North Carolina. He was an academic and structured. James Taylor was not wired that way. He was an artistic musician. So in some senses, he feels like he disappoints his father by becoming a musician in the West Coast of New York City. He develops a really bad drug problem. And in the midnights of the darkness of his drug problem in the village, the East Village of New York, he calls his father, saying, I'm really at the end of my world. I need help. And his father drives from North Carolina to pick up his son and to kind of, in essence, take him home and to get him help. And so Carolina, in my mind, is not like, you should go to the beaches of North Carolina. It's like you have a father, or I had a father, who would drive in the middle of the night to pick up his disappointed son, or his, the son that he probably was disappointed in, but still gave him grace and love in the midst of this brokenness of his sad decisions he had made. So when he's singing about sunshine, I got Carolina on my mind, so like, how awesome it is that I have a dad who would drive in the middle of the night to pick me up. Is that awesome or what? So I you know, heard that and read that in the morning of Saturday, and I had just lost my dad to a very rare form of cancer. So I'm reading this and thinking, that was like my dad, <laughs> right? So I'm like crying Saturday morning. My wife wakes up, she's like, why are you crying? <laughs> it's 9 a.m. in the morning on Saturday. Right? I'm like, Carolina, my mind's about a dad, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and really, what a portrait that was for me of our Heavenly Father, who would do that for us. Um, Luke 9.51, one of the most well-kept secret verses of the Bible. It says, Jesus uh, resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Like, turns towards Jerusalem, and nothing is going to stop him. And that's out of love and faithfulness and for forgiveness for you. So what the Lord does in this world that is so anxious and so longing and so tribal and so lonely, he says, you have a sense of identity and belonging where? In me. You've heard the maybe St. Augustine quote, our heart is restless until it rests. What a dynamic quote. Do you see a restless world right now? My goodness. And not only that, and here's where I want to go next. He offers not only a sense of identity and belonging in him, he offers a sense of identity and belonging to his people. So I grew up in upstate New York. Upstate New York is not a beacon of Missouri Synod Lutheranism. Let's just get that off the bat. Um, so I, in fact, ready for this? I hope you're okay with this. I wasn't baptized Lutheran. <laughs> Are you still okay with me? <laughs> Leave if you want to. Okay? <laughs> it was I, yes. So uh, my family grew up in the Congregational Church. We made a geographic move when I was four years old to a different town in upstate New York. The healthy Bible-believing church in our town was the Lutheran Church. So I just knew that it was a healthy church. It really turned me on to who Jesus was. How I had a sense of identity and belonging to him, I began to pursue ministry. I'm like, dude, I don't know if I want to be a preacher, but I sure want to help people discover what I found in who Jesus was. A lot of my friends weren't Christians, family members weren't Christians. So I went to Concordia University of Chicago, and that's where I found out that I was actually I was actually part of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And things were taught to me where I'm like, whoa, like do we really believe that? Like, wow. I had this sense, like, do I really fit in here? I got through Concordia University of Chicago, which was very, very, very good to me. I went to the seminary, which was very good to me, but I was the only one from the Atlantic District at the seminary in my class. And I felt like an outsider. 
Have you ever felt like an outsider anywhere? Around that time, a few years earlier before I went to seminary, 9-11 happens. You talked about being in the Pentagon. I grew up north of New York City, in upstate New York. But everyone where I grew up knew someone who was impacted by 9-11. We had family members and friends whose dads worked in the city or worked in the Twin Towers. An incredibly emotional time for New Yorkers. So I go to the seminary and because I'm from the Atlantic District, I think uh, I got sent to like the most theologically conservative church in the St. Louis area for field work. Welcome to my group therapy session, by the way. <laughs> so I'm. Um, this is just coming off a time in, in where I grew up with the leader of the Atlantic District, Dave Banky, who was here at this conference today. I gave him a hug yesterday. <clears throat> Went into a public space, Yankee Stadium, and said a prayer. This conversation is not about the legitimacy of that. Let you decide that. Well, I'm a speaker, so I'll tell you, it was awesome. All right. What he did was courageous because those were the hearts. He was trying to serve the people of his community, and that was the decision he made. Amen. Okay, so I go to this church and nobody knows who I am, no one knows my background, and I'm sitting in a room like you are, where all they're doing is talking about how horrible it was that he did what he did. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know if I really belong here anymore. It was a horrible feeling. And I said to my wife, we had kind of finished Concordia Chicago, I was on the pre-seminary track, finished my first two years of field work, my first two years of the seminary, and I said, I don't know if I fit in this church body. And she said, well, too late. <laughs> no, she didn't say that. She was like, hey, it's all right. You know, the Lord will lead us well. She did all the right things. And then I got sent to my vicarage church, which was Woodbury Lutheran Church in Woodbury, Minnesota. And Dean Nattesee was my vicarage supervisor. Some of you know him, maybe someone who a wonderful human being to me. And what came out of that for me was that you do belong here. Like, God has wired you with certain experiences and backgrounds, and like, you need to be how God created you to be, to be the best pastor that you can be, right? So in that moment, kind of in that transition, I personally went from kind of feeling like an outsider, do I fit in, to, oh my goodness, I do fit in. Like, there is a place and a space for me. And I wonder if you've had an experience like that, where you kind of felt like an outsider, and then you get brought in and feel like, oh my goodness, like, this is good. And, and that's the Lord's vision for his church. That he takes people who kind of feel like outsiders, do they really fit in, and say, no, regardless of your background or personal history or mistakes you've made or things that you think are true right now that might act not actually be true, this is the very place where you belong, is God's church. God gives us a sense of identity and belonging, not only in him, but also in his people. So let's talk briefly about how he does this and how this is woven through the scriptures. In Genesis 1 and 2, when he creates, remember, God says, it is not good for man to be what? Alone. In essence, if you look deeply at the Hebrew, it says, men need help. <laughs> We're not meant to be alone. We're meant to be in community with one another. He creates one. This is the pinnacle of his creation. It is very good. It says, I want you to experience the power of community. And then this is interesting. He actually sends people into tribes. Quick note, did he need to create tribes? It could have just been like God's people Israel. But there was something that God realized about, no, I just want to put you in tribes. Have you thought about why he did that? I think he wanted to give people a sense of, in the broader community of being Israelites, God's people, we're of the tribe of Judah. We're the tribe of Benjamin. Like, we're going to be us together. How about this? The mere fact that Jesus calls 12 disciples to himself. Could Jesus have got to the cross and rose again on Easter Sunday and done his public ministry without his disciples? Answer? Yes. Of course he could have. But he chooses to have disciples around him to exactly what you guys talked about 10 minutes ago, to have that powerful shared experience to launch themselves into ministry. And I love this part. 
Jesus sends them out one by one or two by two. You know, this is the most inefficient thing that Jesus ever does. But incredibly, it's way more efficient. If he's going to send disciples out to preach to different towns and villages, my imperfect sense would have recommended to Jesus as a consultant, you really need to send them one by one. You'll cover twice as much ground. But what does Jesus do? Two by two. Let me ask you, why? I'm sorry? You can support each other. Because when you get rejection, you're going to want like someone, a sister or brother, beside you. Jesus intentionally uses two by two. How about this? Do you remember Jesus in the garden? What does he say to his disciples? Hey, would you guys mind just hanging with me for a little while? Because this is going to be tough. This is the only time that I can think of the New Testament where Jesus asks his disciples to do something for him. And what is it? Can you guys just stay up with me? Keep watch with me? And how do they do with that, by the way? I fell asleep. I fell asleep. That must have been so discouraging for Jesus. Like, guys, I haven't asked one thing of you this whole time. All I asked you was, can you just stay with me? So, you know what that teaches me? Even Jesus needed a sense of community and belonging with other people. And we do what we do best, which is fail like ragamuffins. How about Acts chapter 2? Acts chapter 2 does not record the disciples experiencing the resurrection of Jesus Christ and saying, and every single individual person personally received the resurrection of Jesus Christ as for them. That's not Acts chapter 2. What is Acts chapter 2? All the people got brought together. They shared what they had together. They rubbed shoulders with one another. They experienced the things of God together. So get this, from the very beginning, post-resurrection, Jesus' vision for his people is that they would hang, not alone, but together. And of course, you've heard and seen those images in Revelation of what the end, of uh, what heaven's going to be like. Every tribe, nation, tongue, people group brought together, praising God together. I don't know if you can see this, but it's also on your handout. Uh, this is the well kept secret. Exodus 35, uh, about nine verses. I'm going to read it, and as you hear it, I want you to be thinking in your mind, how is this community practiced? All right, then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence, and everyone who was willing and whose heart moved them came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting. They're building something for all its service and for the sacred garments. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, rings, and ornaments. They all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. Everyone who had blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen, or goat hair, ram skins, dyed red, or other durable leather brought them. Those presenting an offering of silver or bronze brought it, brought it as an offering to the Lord. And everyone who had acacia wood for any part of the work brought it. Every skilled woman spun with her hands and brought what she had spun, blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, and fine linen. And all the women who were willing and had the skill spun their goat hair. The leaders brought onyx, stones, and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breast piece. They also brought spices and olive oil from the light and from the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord free will offerings for all the work the Lord, through Moses, had commanded them to do. Question, how do you see God's vision for community practiced in that moment? It was not done alone. It was not done alone. Bring what you got. Bring what you got. What's it? Potluck! The first potluck, right? They were Lutheran in the book of Exodus. The word willing. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's all over the text, actually. Common purpose. Common purpose is right. I wasn't they had those things. I, I, I kind of thought the same. I, they, this must have been things that they brought, or... Well, they did, 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 they did. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so it's like all of these different things, David. Yeah, Moses didn't, he was alone as the leader. Yeah. It was the people. And it's almost like every sentence kind of is the same. It's like, okay, I get the point. All these different things, everybody brought them together. So this sense of, you know, community is not like a disciples and Jesus thing. This is like woven into the scriptures from the very beginning. So here's then where we land. God's vision for his people is that this might be experienced among us today. How do we do that? Worship, relationships, and service. So uh, a number of years ago, I had a trip out of town for, for ministry. And I woke up, I had, it was a Sunday morning, I had church in the morning, I had a flight out of O'Hare like at 2 p.m., so kind of the timetable's tight, right? And I woke up in the middle of the night, and it was in the middle of winter, and my house was cold. Is that a good sign? No. <laughs> yeah, so that means, like, something's wrong with your furnace. And, like, and I have no exact repair background. So do you have, like, an ordained pastor, like, looking at a furnace? Like, I don't know what to look for, right? So, like, the knucklehead part of me is like, well, let me take a flashlight and turn it off and turn it on. I mean, like, what do I got here? So I'm going to get to the point where, okay, here's what I determined. My furnace wasn't working, okay? So it's a Sunday morning at a 2 p.m. flight. It's the middle of the winter. I have uh, a family of five, so my wife and three kids. How does it feel the thought of going to church on Sunday morning for an 8 o'clock service when you know you're leaving your wife and three kids with a whole cold house and a flight out of town at 2 o'clock. Right? I felt literally horrible. But here's when that happened. Here's when the whole thing happened. I got brought into church and we started singing hymns. Like, great is your faithfulness. And just like all the voices of our people at 8 o'clock... Uh, did something for me. Can you imagine that, by the way? So, if I wasn't a pastor and my furnace had broke, would I have been at church that day? Probably not. I would have been scrambling to call something plus the furnace fix. Instead, I was in the very place I needed to be. Because my heart reset from, oh my gosh, what am I going to do to fix it to, God is good, great is thy faithfulness. He'll see me through this. And while I was in church, my wife texted me, hey, good news, you know, our friend Jackson would come over and look at the furnace. I'm like, God, you are good. Great is your faithfulness. Right? But it was like this moment where I didn't really feel like I wanted to be there. But then the mere act of being there, being with others, I was reminded of what's true and real. But it's not just worship that does this. It's rubbing shoulders with other Christians that does this. Think about it. My kids, 14, 12, and, and almost to be 10 years old, their whole lives are basically spent with either kids their age, or my wife and I, or their sports coaches. They don't spend any time with senior citizens except for one place. Where is it? Our church lobby. And Every Sunday that they're there, they interact with senior citizens who care for them and interact with them. We've started to, as a church, rally around that idea, so here's what we did. We had all of our youth group be in the lobby in between services and had all of our seniors who had tech issues with iPads or phones bring their phones, and we paired them up with the senior citizens. I paired them up with a youth grouper. It was like one of the most beautiful pictures of church I've ever seen. Like a lobby full of 13-year-old boys with senior citizens looking at iPads. And the mistakes that senior citizens had made with their stuff was awesome. And the fact that our students got them fixed was even more awesome. And we try to do that over and over because it's such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, when I arrived at the church I first served, I'm the third 
church, I'm the third pastor in our church's history and the first not to have an affair. Can you clap for me, please? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I arrived into a situation and um, it was pretty traumatic. Like, and I thought, like, this will be, you know, this will work out great. Like, because I'm me. <laughs> I drastically underestimated like the hurt that they had been through. And at one point I thought about like maybe I should present here to talk about what I learned about that. Uh, the first thing I learned was never hire a 29 year old. Um, that was really a couple hard years, but here's what I really got out of it. The hard thing that that church lived through twice brought that church together in an incredibly powerful way. There was a little bit of like at each other the decisions they made in the midst of the journey, but the fact that they came together was like this army of people who are have such tight relationships that once we leverage that and get past the hurt and the wounding and kind of process that a little bit, like look out. And then finally, service. There's this moment in Matthew chapter 14 we don't talk about enough where uh, Jesus arrives on the scene and there's a lot of hungry people. And uh, remember the disciples say to Jesus, hey, uh, where are we going to get food for all these people? Do you remember what Jesus actually said? Yeah, um, you give them something to eat. That never makes it to a Christian bumper sticker or coffee mug or confirmation verse. Jesus, you give them something to eat. But Jesus could have been like, what? Like, All right, I'll take care of it. But instead he says, hey, I want you to gather what we have here. And they get a minimal amount of bread and a minimal amount of fish. And it turns into, you know the story, enough to feed everybody. But did he have to involve the disciples? Answer, absolutely not. But he does it so that they can experience the power of doing that together and to be a part of it. Okay, so I think you're tracking with me here. Culturally, we've got a problem. Jesus provides a solution. What I want to talk about in the last maybe 10 minutes or so is, okay, what habits or practices can we as church leaders, you as a church leader where God has uniquely placed you, kind of elevate this concept of community? All right. First of all, how do we facilitate this? The reality is this. This starts with me. Repeat that with me really quickly. This starts with me. This is not like a presentation that I'll make that says, here's the program to do so that everyone around you or that you have influence over starts practicing community better. Instead, it's okay, if I want to see this work of God among the people I serve with, how does it happen? It first starts with me. There's this moment in Luke chapter 2 where Jesus is left behind in Jerusalem. Maybe you remember this story. This is the original home alone in the Bible. Okay? And they find 12-year-old Jesus not in like the first century Palestinian arcade or something. But remember, he's in the temple. And it's awesome what Luke records that Jesus is doing. Mary and Joseph find Jesus ready in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking questions. Last night, uh, Pastor Schrank quoted Francis Schaeffer. Let's do it again. If I have only one hour with someone, I will spend the first 55 minutes asking questions and finding out what is troubling their heart and mind. And then in the last five minutes, I will share something of the truth. Is that a great quote or what? And the question was, if you got an hour to share the gospel with somebody, what would you do? He says, well, I'd ask questions for 55 minutes. That kind of, kind of goes against maybe what you think. Or think you'd i present all the ways in which the gospel is true. And then the last minute I asked him, did you receive this? What is that? Pastor Schaefer says, you know what I do? I just ask a bunch of questions for 55 minutes. I think in a culture of hot takes and tweets and angry board meetings where everybody has an opinion, 
the best way for the church to position itself is an entity that goes in the community and asks a whole boatload of questions. So what might those questions be? Here's my favorite one. Not, how's it going? Because what do you get? Uh, fine. Terrible. Terrible. Uh, don't ask. Don't ask. Right. Stressed. Busy. Overwhelmed. So I kind of can't, I, I don't ask that question anymore. Here are my two favorite questions. What's it like to be you right now? Is that really, oh, do you, you want to know? I'll tell you. Here's, here's what I've lived through. Here's what it's like to be me. And then this one. What's on your mind these days? I've started to ask that question a little more. Because it kind of um, lets them present, like, what's the overflow of their brain. I um, wonder if you're familiar with this. Has anyone seen this image before? This is dynamite that you have never used then. Um, this is by an author named Mark Brackett. He wrote a book called Permission to Feel, which is an excellent book. He presents this, which is called the mood meter. The top are all high energy emotions. The bottom are all low energy emotions. You can see kind of the axis here, high energy, low energy. The left side is low pleasantness emotions. The right side is all high pleasantness emotions. So this is when you're like high energy, high presence. This is when you are high energy, fired up, angry. This is, you're at the spa. You're happy, content, calm, fulfilled, carefree. You're not amped up, you're just chill. This is overwhelmed, lonely, miserable, apathetic. Um, the language that David Brooks Collins said is languishing. So he said that's the most common COVID emotion, just kind of gone. That's the bottom left quadrant. So if the best way to use this exercise is to use it as a staff. I've used it with my confirmation kids. I've used it in kind of one-on-one -on -one or marriage counseling sessions. I simply present this mood meter to them. And I say, um, give me a quadrant and give me about three emotions that you feel. And it just helps people actually identify what the emotion they're feeling is, which then is a pathway to talk about it. Does that make sense? So tell me why you're here. What leads you there? That's called, again, that's called the mood meter. How do we facilitate that? All right, um, when I was a seminary student, we were, as you heard me talk about earlier, assigned to a field work church. The seminary had previously had issues where field work students go to their field work churches and create chaos by telling church members what they're doing wrong or what the church is doing wrong. So before we got sent out on field work, we had to learn a mantra, a talking point that we would say, if anyone from the church approached us and asked a question, like, what do you think about this worship service? Or what do you think about that Bible study that we're doing? So the mantra was this, are you ready for it? I'm only a seminarian. I don't know a lot about that yet. That sounds like something you should talk to the pastor about. Make sense? Uh, so we had to like repeat that over and over until we learned that. I'm only a seminarian. I don't know a lot about that yet. That sounds like something you should talk to pastor about. In the midst of COVID conflict in the last year, I kind of talked to the congregation. I serve a mantra for a different purpose, a talking point about what to do when you're at a dinner table or hanging with friends and you find out you disagree. And the mantra was this, that's interesting. I'm not sure I see it the same way that you do, but I'm really glad we're friends. Because what that does is it undoes the, if someone thinks differently than me, they're my enemy. Which unfortunately is very common right now. There is a quote from a gentleman by the name of Les Stroh. He's 
says this, conflict is inevitable, enemies are optional. So uh, we taught our church to say, um, that's interesting. I'm not sure I see it the same way that you do, but I'm glad we're in a church family together. Or how about this? Um, that's interesting. I'm not sure I see it the same way that you do, but I'm glad you're my spouse. <laughs> Try that one. Okay, and actually what it does is it actually lowers the temperature in the room. It affirms the other person. It creates a safe space to actually talk about and ask about, how did you come to that conclusion? Uh, I'm from the state of Illinois. Illinois still has a mask, your mask mandate about till the end of February, including our schools until about this week, uh, Sunday night, when there was a ruling that, well, let's not get into it. So it created this kind of open season, and we'll wrap up here in just a minute, kind of open season for what's going to happen in schools. So then we had protesters outside of my kids' middle school telling the kids as they were coming in, you're allowed to take your masks off, don't listen to your teachers or whatever, you're allowed to not wear it. Was, it was kind of chaos, okay? So I drive my kids to school. There's people out front of my kids' school who are members of the church I serve because, you know, we raise up passionate people. Love it. And also members of the community that I know. And they're kind of protesting, and I waved at them. And my daughter said, oh my gosh, why are you waving? Because, you know, what you do best as a dad of a middle school girl is, you know, embarrass them. So she said, Dad, why are you waving? I just turned and looked at her and said, because they're human beings. You know, it's not like an endorsement of what they're doing. It's just like, you're a human being. I wave at a human being. Even if I don't really think it's that great that you're protesting outside of my kid's middle school, you're still a human being. That's, in essence, practicing. Um... That's interesting. I'm not sure I see it the same way that you do, but I'm still glad we're in a community together. I think there's a lot of room for that in our culture. And then here's the last thing I've been kind of trying to deal with and live with. It's kind of a, 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 an alliteration device as I go into conversation. And it's simply living OCI. And here's what I mean by that. I am trying to commit to being open in conversations that I'm having with others. Let me ask you a quick question. Have you ever gone into a conversation with someone and you've changed how you thought about that person because of the conversation? Of course. Right? How about this? Has anyone ever prejudged you based on something else and you felt like crap because they prejudged you before you even had a chance to talk to them? How does that feel? To me, that feels horrible. So what I'm trying to do is go into conversations with church members, family members, friends and people in our community, a lot less already having decided what they're thinking and why they're thinking that way, or what it was in their personal history that led them to think that way. Instead, I'm going into the conversation open. I haven't made up my mind about that person yet. Did Jesus do that? <laughs> Absolutely. He walks town to town, village to village, radically open to what that person has for them. Secondly, I go into it curious. I'm genuinely curious why my brother thinks the way he does. Like, how can you come to that conclusion? I respect you, you are wicked smart, but boy, you think differently than I do. Instead of being like, you're wrong. It kind of goes into it, just a lot more curious. And then finally, I'm committing to being more inquisitive. Best TV show in human history is Columbo. Did you ever see Columbo? Yeah. Yeah. I love Columbo. What does he do? He walks around non-threateningly asking a question. Right? He simply says, it's just one more thing that I don't quite understand. For the bosses back at the station, they're making me fill out the paperwork. And it's so disarming, it kind of lowers the temperature, that at the end of most Columbo episodes, the perpetrators feel what about Columbo? Yeah, they're kind of like, oh, hey, on, Bo, you were actually for me. The best one ever is the Johnny Cash one. That's my favorite. You know, and by the end, he kind of just surrenders to Columbo because he likes him so much. Why? Because Columbo takes this open, curious, inquisitive posture towards culture. 
last two things I want to share with you. Here's what we eventually landed on as a church as we were making really difficult COVID decisions. We said how we make decisions together, like the process, is as important or more important than the actual decision itself. Do you know what I mean by that? So we were going into meetings and kind of like immediately going into camps and picking sides. And the bottom of the barrel moment was when we were counting votes. I'm embarrassed to say that I was. How's this person going to think? How's that person going to think? Just to get to the right decision in my mind. That was what it looks like when a pastor doesn't trust his lay leadership. Instead, I said, hey, time out. We gotta work on the process. We gotta work on asking better questions among one another to determine why it is that we feel a certain way. And when we did that work, we ended up with much better decisions because we were doing it together and we were asking questions and we were taking time to actually hear one another and not interrupt one another. Get this, how long does it take the average general practitioner to interrupt their patients? 13 seconds. <laughs> no offense to the general practitioners in the room, okay? But that means that the average person gets 13 seconds to share their symptoms with their general practitioner before they get interrupted. It's horrible. That doesn't feel right. Right, so we want to create spaces in churches as leadership where how we make decisions together is as important or more important than the decision itself. And finally, we are going to model here what we want to see out there. So if you're not liking as a church in the community how the world or culture around you is going at this, divided, isolated, tribal, at each other. Let's commit to turning our church into a mini laboratory. What we want to see the community doing, sitting, listening, asking questions, being open, curious, and inquisitive. What if you as a leader said, we're going to commit to doing this process better, trusting the result is going to lead us well. All right, so some of what I talked about today is actually in this book. Um, I worked with CPH. Our church body has a phenomenal publishing house, Concordia Publishing House. They are hardworking, honest, and seeking to serve our community and our churches. It was awesome to work with them. So this is the book I wrote. It's called Connected to Christ, Overcoming Isolation Through Community. It's some of the principles that I shared earlier, and then some of what I talked about today was not in the book. Um, you also have on your desks, this is like a sermon series that you can work through as a church or as a small group Bible study. So it kind of lays out what the weeks would look like. And then on the inside is simply kind of like a uh, like space for you, for you or for your people uh, to make notes or comments. You can find, you can uh, reach out to me after this, find me at our church's website or on Facebook. Uh, all these resources are on cph.org's website. Um, Deb Burma, who's here, is a fellow CPH author. Um, Deb's church went through this material, and I had a lot of fun, Deb, working with your group. Oh, I just shout out. I worked through him. It was so well received at our church. We worked through it together, and in our final session, we soon wanted to I think our, our people were like, oh, really this is so cool. Yeah. And Brian, you know, they got to Q&A with Brian, and that was phenomenal. Yeah, thank you so much. I will see you job, and thank you for your work as well. Hey, it was really good to have this conversation with you. I'll stick around if you have any questions. But God bless your work where the Lord has you. Have a great rest of your day.